We'll be taking a look at this lab, exploiting cross-site scripting to steal cookies. Now there is some good news and some bad news here. The good news is we get to see what the next step might look like after finding a cross-site scripting attack vector. Very often we are just popping up an alert to the page, but that's obviously not what an attacker is going to be doing in the wild. The objective is to use that cross-site scripting vulnerability to perhaps steal a user's session or cookies. So we're going to see what that next step might look like. The bad news is that this particular lab is designed to be solved using Burp Collaborator. It's a feature that's only available in the professional version of Burp. So if you've got plenty of spare cash and you want to run the easy version of this lab, solving it the way it was intended, then you can purchase a year subscription for 399. We're going to be looking at the alternate solution, assuming that you don't have the professional version of Burp Suite. Can we still use it? Assuming we don't have Burp Suite Professional, the attack becomes more complex. It's not just a regular cross-site scripting attack to steal the victim's cookies and then impersonate the victim. If we want to solve this lab without using Burp Collaborator, we are also going to need to throw in a cross-site request forgery attack. So the order of operations here, we will have a cross-site scripting attack, which will lead to cross-site request forgery. We're then going to manipulate a stolen cookie for an active session hijacking attack. So there's really three different components to solving this particular lab without using Burp Collaborator. Now, before we fire up the lab, let's just think very broadly about how a cross-site scripting attack is used to steal a victim's session information or cookie in this case. So we're hopefully familiar with the idea of a cross-site scripting attack. It means that arbitrary JavaScript is being executed in the victim's browser. We often look for proof of concept with a cross-site scripting attack simply by popping up an alert function. But what a real attacker is going to do rather than pop up an alert function, they're going to create some type of HTTP request, at least this is one method. So the idea is HTTP request is created perhaps using JavaScript's fetch. The user's browser is manipulated into sending a HTTP request to an attacker owned endpoint. And of course, along with that HTTP request, there will often be sent session information such as a cookie. So all the attacker has to do is check the HTTP requests coming into that endpoint. They can grab the user's cookie. They can then use that cookie to hijack the victim's session. Now, what is Burp Collaborator? Burp Collaborator is that endpoint. And the way this lab is set up is that we will only be able to send requests to the Burp Collaborator endpoint. This is to stop us from manipulating the lab into sending malicious HTTP requests to external sites. In other words, we could use this vulnerability in the lab to attack a website outside of portswigger.net. As you can imagine, portswigger don't want us doing that. The problem is we can't set up our own endpoint to poll for those HTTP requests because we can only send those HTTP requests to Burp Collaborator. However, notice the following in the lab guidelines. Some users will notice that there is an alternative solution to this lab that does not require Burp Collaborator. However, it is far less subtle than exfiltrating the cookie. Okay, without further ado, let's fire up the lab. So the pretense here is that this is some type of blog. We can view different posts in the blog. Each post in the blog has its own ID. For example, we can see in the URL that this post has an ID of four. We can post comments on these blog posts and the basic idea here is that this comment field is extremely vulnerable to cross-site scripting. In fact, we can simply just use script tags in this comment section without any kind of problem whatsoever. So as proof of concept, let's just include some script tags in this comment box. We have to fill out these fields because there is some JavaScript verification if we want to post to the back end. We are also going to track this HTTP request using burp will be interested in how exactly the post request to create a comment post is formed. We will need that to solve this lab without Burp Collaborator. So let's click the post comment button. You can see it says, thank you for your comment. If we head back to the blog, we should now see our newly created comment. 
and you can see straight away those script tags are being passed and we have a cross-site scripting attack vector in place. So we can run arbitrary JavaScript on the victim's browser. Using Burp Collaborator, we would ideally use that JavaScript to send a HTTP request along with the victim's cookie to that Collaborator endpoint. But seeing as we can't access that endpoint without Burp Collaborator, we're instead going to write JavaScript that causes the victim to post their session cookie as a blog comment. Now you might remember in the lab guidelines, it said the alternative solution was less subtle. And that's because if we get the victim to post their cookie as a blog comment, it means any other visitor to the page is going to see the victim's session cookie. So they'll know the victim's session cookie and they will know that an attack has taken place. Whereas if we compare getting the victim to send a HTTP request to the endpoint, other visitors will not be able to see that session cookie and there will be less evidence that an attack has taken place. But really the challenge here for us is actually just solving the lab without needing to use Burp Collaborator. And as we mentioned, more work is involved as a result. Let's now check out the HTTP request that was used to post our comment. So we can see a post request to the endpoint forward slash post forward slash comment. We can see our session cookie being sent along with the request. Now keep in mind that this is what we ultimately want to steal because if we have access to the victim's session cookie, then we can hijack their session using that cookie. The good news is that accessing that cookie is very straightforward when we can run arbitrary JavaScript on the victim's browser. We can simply reference document.cookie and you can see we get our session ID. Scrolling down further on the request used to create the comment, we have some parameters that need to be sent along with the post request. The first parameter is CSRF. This is a cross-site request forgery token. It ensures that the request originates from the same location as the place where the form was generated. We'll take a look at that shortly. Let's just review the other parameters. So we have post ID, fairly self-explanatory, comment, so that was our cross-site scripting attack that we posted, name, email, website. All of these are very easy to provide arbitrary values to when we get the victim to post a comment. The harder part is this cross-site request forgery token, because without that, we're not going to be able to post a comment on behalf of the user. So let's review quickly how these cross-site request forgery tokens work. We'll take a look at the page source. We know towards the bottom of the page, there is a form. And notice that there is an automatic field added to this form. So input type equals hidden. So the user doesn't need to see this on the page itself, but they won't know what this cross-site request forgery token is unless they are the one that rendered the form to begin with. So this is really what stops the attacker just submitting a post on behalf of the user by sending all of this data to the post comment endpoint because they won't know what the CSRF token value is unless they were the one that accessed the form to begin with. The thing is though, since we can run arbitrary JavaScript, it's fairly easy to access the value of this cross-site request forgery token. Now there are different ways to access this using JavaScript. So perhaps the easiest one is just to look at the name attribute there because very likely this is the only element on the page that has a name attribute with the value CSRF. So back on our page, we can reference document dot get element and it has to be plural, I think in this case by name. And we can just pass in the value CSRF and we need to pass index zero because it's the first element so the idea is that this is going to likely return some kind of array since it's elements in plural. We want the first result, even though there's only one, but we need to reference index zero. And of course we want the dot value attribute of that. And guess what? We've now referenced the CSRF token and we can do this in the victim's browser as well. So at this stage, we have everything we need to start writing the JavaScript for this attack. So we'll write this in a JavaScript file. 
of course, we will actually be writing this in a HTML context, so we will need script tags at the end. But for now, we're just going to make use of JavaScript. The correct way of using JavaScript to post a form is to make use of the form data class. So let's initialize new class. We'll say var data equals new form data. And the idea is we can now add different key value pairs that we want to post as part of the form. So we can simply use data dot append. We add the name of the field. So let's start with CSRF and we're going to pass a CSRF token. Now we haven't assigned a value to that yet. We'll get to that shortly, but just for now, let's take a look at the flow of this. We simply say data dot append. So we now need to add a post ID, which will decide depending on which post we're going to attack. Let's just give an arbitrary value for now. Data dot append comment. Now the idea with the comment is we want the victim to post their cookie. So we're going to reference document.cookie. Remember we saw how easy it was to reference that name. We'll just call the victim victim just so we can differentiate any comments posted by the victim. Data.append email. So again, this is mostly just an arbitrary field. It doesn't matter too much what we put here. But the idea is it may be required, so we're just going to include it anyway, but it's not really part of the attack itself. It will just help us to bypass verification if these values are required. So we'll just pass a website in as well. And this is not too important what we put, but there may be some verification, like it might have to start with HTTP or HTTPS, for example. Now we can make use of the JavaScript fetch API for creating HTTP requests. So we know the endpoint is going to be post comment. Now we need to specify any data. So we need to say method is going to be post. So post request mode. And for this, we're actually going to put no cause body. And we can just reference that data variable that we've created. Okay, so we don't have a value yet for token. So we need to create that token value. So let's do that at the top. So we're going to say var token. And remember the way we get this is document dot get elements by name. We can pass CSRF as the name. We want the element at index zero, and then we can call dot value. So we've now accessed the cross site request forgery token. We've passed that as part of the form. Now we're almost there. There is still a little bit of a problem with this, and it's to do with the way that items are rendered to the DOM. So that CSRF token is actually rendered to the DOM by JavaScript, and it means it's not immediately going to be there on initial page load. So if this JavaScript is called too soon, then the CSRF token won't exist and will obviously not be passed in any subsequent HTTP request by the fetch API. So we need to delay this JavaScript from executing until the DOM has fully loaded. Thankfully, this is not too difficult with JavaScript. So we're going to reference window, add event listener. And the event we're going to listen for is DOM content loaded. And we want a callback function. So this is the event that's going to fire after the DOM's loaded. So we wait for the DOM to completely load. That means the cross-site request forgery token is going to be attached to that form. We can then access using JavaScript. The victim will then post a comment on the blog. And the idea is that this is simulated by the lab. So after we've submitted our attack, the lab will pretend to be a victim visiting that specific page. And if there is any cross-site scripting attack, it's going to be executed for the victim. And of course, that includes any associated session information. Before we paste this in, we do need to add some script tags, which you wouldn't ordinarily do in a JavaScript file, but we need the script tags so we can paste this as a comment. Okay, there is our payload. We may change the post ID value when we paste this, depending on which post we're going to attack. So we're back at the post with an ID of four. This actually has that cross-site scripting alert. We don't want to see that every time. So let's jump on over to post ID equals five. So this is a fresh attack canvas. We are going to post our attack. We're going to change the post ID to five since that's the post we're looking at. We need to fill in the arbitrary values here. Let's post this. 
So in the background now, the lab will be simulating a victim visiting this specific page. Let's go back to blog and we can see the victim has visited the page and has posted the value of document.cookie. And we can see there are two values to that cookie. We have secret, which could be some kind of password. We don't know. It's obviously been hashed. So one possible attack vector is to try and decrypt the specific hash to see if we can get something useful, perhaps a password, for example. But we don't really need that because we actually have the session ID. This is where we get to the third part of this attack, which is going to be session hijacking. So let's copy this particular cookie. Let's head back to Burp. And let's take a look at this get request to my account. Let's send that to the repeater. And we are simply going to add a cookie. So we'll say cookie with a capital C. And we are going to paste that session ID that we've stolen from the victim. Let's send that. We're going to render the response. And notice it says my account, your username is administrator. So we clearly have access to this administrator account. Now we don't get a flag here in this output, but if we head back to the lab itself, you can see we get the pop-up, congratulations, you've solved the lab. So quick recap here, there were three stages to this attack. The first stage was a cross-site scripting attack where we were able to run arbitrary JavaScript in the victim's browser. We could then potentially use that to send a HTTP request to an attacker-owned endpoint but we didn't do that in this case because we need Burp Collaborator for that, the way this lab is set up. So instead, we decided to use that cross-site scripting attack to post a comment on the blog on behalf of the victim. Now, unlike the HTTP request, in order to post the blog comment, we actually need that cross-site request forgery token because there's some protection in place. So without that token, we can't post a comment on behalf of the victim. Since we're already able to execute arbitrary JavaScript, we were also able to use that JavaScript to access the cross-site request forgery token. We then use that to post a comment on behalf of the victim. So that's the second stage of this attack, which is cross-site request forgery. So it's a combination of cross-site scripting and cross-site request forgery. Once the victim had posted to the blog, we then had access to his session cookie and we were able to use that to log into his account. This is something that's known as active session hijacking. So those are the three stages to this attack. If you do have Burp Collaborator and you want to solve this lab the easy way, know that the solution is actually here in the lab description. So it's similar in some ways, but it's less involved because there's no need for that cross-site request forgery in the process because we don't need a token in order to post to the Burp Collaborator endpoint. So it now becomes a simple case of cross-site scripting attack, where we use JavaScript to make a HTTP request on behalf of the victim, followed by the session hijacking, but no need for the cross-site request forgery. All right, thanks for watching, guys. One of the things I like about this lab is how we have a few different concepts tying together. It also helps us to see the relevance of cross-site scripting because if we've spent all of our time just popping up an alert to the page, we might understand how to execute a cross-site scripting attack, but we might wonder what the point is. Well, now we can see how we can further that cross-site scripting attack vector to potentially steal the user's cookie, which then results in session hijacking. Thanks for watching, guys. Hope you found it helpful.